Before joining the research staff there in 2001, he held appointments at AT&T Bell Labs, Princeton University, University of Edinburgh, and SRI International, and has worked on several classified government programs. Interesting resume there. Dean is also the author or co-author of over 250 technical and popular articles, three dozen book chapters, and now four full-length books, the others of which include the award-winning The Conscious Universe, Entangled Minds, and the 2014 Silver Nautilus Book Award winner, Supernormal. So what do you say we flip this script from prologue to dialogue with the one and only Dr. Dean Radin? Enjoy. Dr. Dean Radin, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. You need no introduction to most of the audience here, but for those who don't know you or aren't aware of your work, what have you been up to for the last 40 years? Uh, I guess uh, I'm a, a, ch a child who read the equivalent of Harry Potter, uh, even though that wasn't written yet when I was a, a kid, uh, and never grew up. That's one way of putting it. One of the, the problems with uh, growing older is that uh, you start to have responsibilities and childhood things like curiosity and spontaneity and simply following your passion begin to go away. And I decided somewhere when I was a teenager, I guess, that I didn't want it to go away. So here I am. And this, by the way, is also true of most of the scientists that I know. We're, we're all cut from the same cloth. <laughs> yeah. So at what point did you really become interested in psychic phenomena? You know, you've been working on this or in this field for about four decades now. Did you develop an interest when you were young or was it as you got older that you really started to take it seriously? I think it was a combination of reading lots of fairy tales. I think I've read every fairy tale that was available in, in our library. And then science fiction after that, and then mythology, and then tales of the mystic masters of the East. And I was just always fascinated by these stories. Uh, and I also, of course, noticed that in television and movies, that these themes are a staple within the entertainment business. So even before I knew about philosophy or mythology or any of the, the scholarly studies of these things, I just wondered, uh, why is this so fascinating? I mean, it's fun while you're in the midst of a story, it's fun reading it, but then I think afterwards of, it's not just me who's drawn to this, everybody's drawn to these things. Well, why is that? So later on, many years later, I discovered, well, this is a long history of a reflection of something that's meaningful to a lot of people. And so the only difference between what I've done and what a lot of other people do is that uh, since I was trained as a scientist, I am able to use those tools to look into these kinds of phenomena. And by hard work and a lot of luck, I managed to find ways of continuing to do this full time for a long time. Definitely, yeah. And I did want to tell you, you know, the, the first time that I heard your name, it rolled off the tongue of one Art Bell. I grew up listening to Coast to Coast with Art, and then when he started his radio shows online here in the last few years, I heard you on there, you know, probably, I don't know, four or five years ago with him, and been a fan of your work ever since. So it really is a joy and an honor to have you here. And before we go any further... You know, in addition to your science background, I also wanted to point out that you have a bit of an artistic background as well, uh, in music specifically. Tell people a bit about that, because I, I think it's something that a lot of people probably don't know about you. Well, I started playing the violin when I was five. At five years old, kids don't know what they want to do, so my parents decided that this was something I should do. I apparently had talent that was recognized early on, so from around the age of maybe seven or eight, I was on the concert violinist track which means that yeah, you spend anywhere between one and four hours a day practicing. And I got good enough, fast enough, so that by the time I was in high school, I was already doing some gigs and in college, continued to play semi-professionally from age five to about 25. And, and up until I was probably about halfway through college, I was imagining that I was going to become a professional violinist, maybe a concert violinist or maybe somebody playing in an orchestra or something like that. Uh, and then I began to realize that uh, while playing the violin was relatively easy for me and was reasonably good at it, it was also hard. I mean, hard work in the sense of the same kind of hard work that an athlete goes through. Because when you're a musician, you are an athlete. Mm -hmm. People don't usually think of it in those terms, but yeah, you're using your body to, to do something. And I've never been particularly strong or had high stamina. And after you play four to eight hours a day as a professional, it's really tiring. So... Fortunately, we had a, an uncle who played the viola on Broadway for Broadway shows. 
and we asked him of his opinion of making a career as a professional musician. And he said, if you can do anything else, don't do this. And I kept getting the same response from all of the professional musicians I knew, that between the gigs and the teaching and occasional orchestras and whatever, it's a hard life. And so fortunately, I was also good in science and mathematics, and I decided that if you could make your living with your mind rather than your body, that seemed like a better approach because then you could use the music for fun rather than it becoming your work. Yeah, so as someone who has been involved then in both creative and scientific endeavors, do you see any commonalities between the two? Well, there's two kinds of scientists. There are scientists who are driven by exploration, curiosity, and creativity. And there's a lot of other scientists who are driven by what might be thought of as, as uh, incremental, very rigorous and strict plotting to – not plotting, but plodding along to improve the edge of what's known. Whereas what, what uh, I see myself as doing and many of my colleagues, we're not interested in the edge of the known. We're, we're interested in what's beyond the known. And it has, it's a huge amount of uncertainty once you get beyond what is already known, which means that you, you have to deal with ambiguity all the time. You have to use your intuition to decide what sort of makes sense and what doesn't because you don't know the right answer yet. For me, I find all of that very exciting. For many others, they don't like it at all. So you, you see the split among the general population in terms of the comfort level, and you see the same thing among scientists too. Is creativity then, is that a central tenant to any sort of scientific exploration? Like if you had to rewrite the scientific method, would it in involve creativity on some level? Well, it kind of does. I mean, uh, all of science is constantly expanding out from where it was uh, and trying to become more comprehensive. So that it always involves some creative aspect. The, the question, though, is the, the separation I was making is between leaps of faith, almost, leaps of intuition into realms where really you hardly understand what's going on, to following the status quo. So in the academic world, which includes most of science, you're judged by what you publish and where you publish it. And if you try to publish something which is too far ahead of the pack, it's very, very difficult partially because people don't know how to evaluate it, and sometimes it's multidisciplinary that makes it even worse. So if you want a career, especially as an academic, you, you're only allowed to take little tiny baby steps. And I felt uh, life is short, and I didn't want to take baby steps. I, I, I wanted to run. In fact, my parents would always remind me that uh, I was walking at nine months which apparently is that's young to yeah. be walking because I was in a hurry, still in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting because you've written a book now called Real Magic, and these are not baby steps, obviously, in your field. But I think we should start by talking about some other terms, namely consciousness and, and psi, which we already sort of alluded to psi here. But you've studied this for four decades, as we said. Let's pull psi out on its own first. At what point did you know that there was something to psychic phenomena? I guess I didn't personally know until about five years after I started doing experiments. Because I, I, I didn't have any, I don't remember any psychic experiences that I had as a kid and don't remember anybody in my immediate or extended family who ever reported it either. All I did is read about it in, in books. So I was driven by curiosity, not by, by experience. But because I had read in books about parapsychology and about how you could use the tools of science to study things like telepathy and precognition and so on, uh, of course, it caught my attention, and I started to try to replicate those effects. And I was able to, to my surprise. And every time I was surprised, I had to do another experiment because it's very difficult to accept that it's real. I mean, you, you go through a standard Western education, especially a scientific or an engineering version of it, you immediately think of certain ways that something like telepathy might exist. Typically, people think of mental radio, like literally radio kinds of signals. Uh, but when you look at the literature, you find out that people have tested this idea, many other ideas for how it would work within what might be thought of as the scientific worldview. It's a, it's a materialistic worldview. And that doesn't work that way which makes it way more interesting to me. I mean, if it turned out that telepathy was something like uh, the, the brain is broadcasting electromagnetic signals, which it does, but people at a distance could decode it somehow and figure out what was going on, that would be interesting. We could probably make things out of it, like psychic garage door openers. <laughs> right. But the fact that it doesn't match that, to me, made it much, much more curious because 
among other things, it says that the scientific worldview is really good at certain things. It's really good at making this podcast work, for example. So materialist science is really good. We don't want to get rid of it, but it doesn't account for everything. And, and so the part of it is simply curiosity to see, well, how do we fix it? And the other is, how do we fix it in a way that it doesn't do violence to what we already know? Because you can't throw away what we already know. That has become my major challenge in the last couple of years, which is why I ended up writing Real Magic, because that is going in that direction. Definitely, but I don't yeah. think I answered your question because I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I believe in the book you define Psy as the scientific study of magic. And that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, that's what, it's what you're doing. You're taking your scientific tools and you're just applying them to the unseen and the unknown. So let's talk about consciousness, though. How does the idea of consciousness relate to Psy <coughs> and magic? Is it the underlying reality that makes it work? Okay, so that was the original question. So here's my answer then to that question. The, what's Psy and what's consciousness? So when I first started started studying psychic phenomena... I would think of it in the way that we, we categorize the phenomena. The phenomena that people report, the experiences that people report are classified into four or five major categories. So we have telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, and then survival-related phenomena. Those are the five categories. So one day I was hearing a talk that somebody was giving about telepathy. I'm thinking of it as, oh, it's telepathy that we're talking about now. So you carve out this as a topic. But then he said at some point, uh, well, of course, all of these kinds of experiences all tell us something about the nature of consciousness. And, and a light bulb went off inside my head because I realized, oh, psi is a kind of experience which clearly must involve consciousness in some way. So this really is about the nature of consciousness. There's all the parapsychology, all the people who are studying mysticism, psychedelic states, all of it is about the nature of experience or awareness. So when I use the word consciousness, I'm imagining that we're talking about awareness, but awareness in the form of something like a, an iceberg, where our conscious everyday awareness is the tip of the iceberg, but there's a huge amount going on under the surface. And so the, the whole thing is related to consciousness. Under the surface level, meaning under your conscious awareness level, through methods like psychedelics and meditation and other techniques, you can begin to to go into greater detail in these, what is normally unconscious states, you can begin to contact it. And a, a case could be made that perhaps somebody who is, is identified as being in an enlightened state, maybe they simply have more that they can bring to bear to this giant iceberg of consciousness. And by the way, the metaphor is interesting because you have this giant structure floating in the ocean. Most of the structure is below the surface of the ocean, and it actually isn't different than the ocean. It looks different, like it's a separate little ice thing, but it's made out of the same stuff. So as a metaphor, it works. The, the top of this iceberg is consciousness with a little C, which is like our conscious awareness. The, the rest of the iceberg is your personal piece of it, which is part of your mind-body connection, but all of it is floating in consciousness with a big C, including your body, including your mind. It's all part of the same thing. Yeah, that was one question that I, I did have was, you know, for you to define the difference between consciousness with a big C and consciousness with a little C, but I think you just did that. So let me throw this at you. You wrote that the goal of the book was to explore real magic from an evidence-based scientific approach. I had a conversation recently with a friend of mine who told me that they don't believe in the subconscious mind. I sort of scoffed at that, but we didn't go much further into it. Now, my friend may consider the evidence-based scientific approach, although even that would be tricky because, you know, when you say, I don't believe in this, we're already at a real disadvantage because beliefs are a tricky thing to, to work with, right? But if you could talk to my friend, uh, who may be listening now, what would you tell them about the subconscious mind and the role it plays in their reality, again, based on scientific evidence? I'm not completely sure how I would interpret someone who says that they don't believe in a subconscious mind. Because in terms of things like pre-conscious processing and visual illusions and auditory illusions and all of psychotherapy and on and on and on, there is an enormous amount of evidence that we have a surface level of awareness, but there's a lot going on behind it. You see this in the neurosciences everywhere, like oh, practically everything that the neurosciences are looking at involve unconscious forms of processing through methods like subliminal perception and lots of other kinds of psychological tests 
you could prove, and that's a pretty hard, that's a strong word in science. You can prove that people are being influenced by lots of things that they actually have no conscious awareness of at all. And this is happening all the time. So people are, I guess, free to believe whatever they want to believe. But in this case, that is a demonstrably wrong belief. So the book, as we've just said, is, is called Real Magic. And I suppose we should define what you mean by that term. So Dr. Raiden, what is real magic? Well, first of all, it's not Harry Potter. That's fictional magic. And it's not Harry Houdini. That, that's uh, feigned magic. It's the real stuff. It's real magic. So when you look at the, uh, the esoteric traditions and you try to synthesize what do people mean by real magic, for all the way from shamanism to today, what you end up with is three categories. You have divination. Uh, divination methods are all about perception through time and space. The classic image is of a witch looking at a crystal ball as one method, but there are probably dozens of methods of divination that have been used. The second is force of will, which is the notion that your intentions can uh, manifest themselves in the world, it can manipulate the physical world. And the third category is theurgy, uh, which is the idea that you that there are spirits, independent intelligent spirits, sometimes not so intelligent but independent entities that you could evoke and uh, have them do things on your behalf. So the, those are the three categories. The reason why they're relevant to science is because of parapsychology, which studies, as in divination, perception through time and space. It studies force of will as psychokinetic effects or poltergeist activity. And it studies things like theurgy through mediumship, near-death experiences, and other kinds of phenomena suggested of some form of persistence of consciousness. So that's the connection. Yeah, yeah. Now, I have plenty of experience with divination. I read my own tarot from, from time to time. I've had plenty of tarot readings that, that have proven to be true, you know, about me or my life or, you know, what I've been through or what I have since gone through. Force of Will, I have some experience with as well. Uh, my logo for the show, I don't know if you can see it on Skype here, but it's a sigil. I created a, my own sigil, which I guess is what all logos are, right, to begin with. So. Yep. But theurgy is something that I've I've not really done much work in. I've not really delved deep into that part of, of magic yet. I am curious from your perspective, from your scientific perspective, do we have proof that, that spirits actually exist? No, we don't. The, the problem with the, the notion of independent, intelligent spirits, which is what mediums, that's, that's what their experience is. They can sometimes see or hear or feel them. All of the evidence, at least from a scientific perspective, is that uh, you cannot discriminate between telepathy or clairvoyance and the information that they get. We know that, that mediums can get accurate information, so that's pretty clear. But interpreting where the information comes from is not clear at all. And, and, it ha and this is a problem that's been going on for almost 150 years since people started to study mediumship. The same is true for near-death experience. Some people would say that a near-death experience occurs, people are floating above the operatory, they see things that they later report, and it seems like they must have been, they were dead, their body was dead, but they were seeing something that was happening, so therefore they must be alive with no body. The problem is we don't know when that perception took place, because they can only report it after the fact. So maybe it took place as they were becoming dead, or as they were becoming resuscitated, we don't know. So to make a strong case for, yeah, the person was dead, but there was still perception happening, you can't make that, at least not with any confidence. And the same goes for every other form of evidence of some kind of persistence of consciousness. When it comes to something like, like ghosts, like in ceremonial magic where you evoke creatures and so on, or, or what channelers, channelers are constantly talking about things talking through them. In every case, you can make up a scenario where there are alternative explanations, which are not mundane, but they also have nothing to do with independent spirits. So I would say that with my scientist hat on, we don't know. We can't, we can't know. And we're, we're trying to become clever enough to figure out ways of discriminating between actual entities and something that's not an entity. So I've shared a story here that relates to this on this podcast a, a couple of times about an experience I had when I was four or five years old on Christmas Eve, still very vivid to me in my mind. I saw what I thought was an elf around our Christmas tree in the middle of the night. I saw it. I got scared by it. I ran back to my bedroom. I 
covered my body, my my face with my sheets, and I was pretty terrified. And when I, I pulled the sheets back down, after I had calmed myself down, that same figure was at the foot of my bed. So how can science explain that? You know, like, I don't know if that was a physical form standing there. Obviously, I did not interact with it, but I did see it. So from your perspective, did I manifest an elf because it was Christmas Eve? Or what could have happened there? We don't know. This is the kind of thing we'd love to be able to figure out how to to study, but like most spontaneous psychic events, you just never know. In fact, you never know with a a relatively mundane event like precognition or telepathy in the real world, you can't tell because it's spontaneous. All we can tell with any confidence is what we can evoke in the laboratory. So if we can figure out a way of making elves appear on on demand, especially if if we can photograph them or something, well, then we have something to study, but otherwise we can't study it. So we don't know. Yeah, it's too bad uh, smartphones didn't exist back when I was four or five years old. I probably would have captured that on Snapchat or something. But I, I would suspect <laughs> that, that if you, you would not have captured what you perceived. Mm. I mean, we, we know enough about perception that to, to recognize that if you have 10 people see the same event or ostensibly some objective event happened and 10 people see it, they will report different things because our attention modulates what we see. Some people will not see it at all which will surprise everybody else. They say, you didn't see that thing? He said, no, I, I saw nothing. So we, we always have to be very careful in, in uh, interpreting people's experiences because it is almost completely dependent on lots of filters, psychological filters and perceptual and lots of other ways that we manipulate what it is that we are perceiving. Definitely, yeah. You know, a couple of subjects that pop up on the show here regularly are astrology and alchemy. And in the book, you mention how astrology evolved into astronomy and alchemy evolved into chemistry. Has magic evolved in the same way then, or will it? Well, that's one of the proposals in the book. The other category is herbalism turned into pharmaceuticals. So if you go back far enough in history, people were always interested in trying to get a better understanding of the nature of reality and how they fit into it. So everyone was developing their own cosmology. Initially, in long pre-scientific times, everything was considered to be supernatural because they didn't have any other way of thinking about it. So everything was caused by the gods in some way. At some point, probably thousands of years ago, people began to notice that there were certain regularities in nature that no longer required the idea of gods. An example is something like magnetism. People were using compasses a long time ago because they just happened to notice that certain kinds of materials, when you float it on a piece of water or something, that they would always tend to point in the same direction. So magnetism was used around 700 years before anybody got an inkling about what it is. And to this day, we can describe magnetism. We have pretty good equations and so on, but nobody actually knows what it is. We don't know what a photon is. I mean, we make up the word photon to describe particles of light, but we don't know what it is. So science in many ways becomes a, a better and better way of, of describing regularities. And we get we are more, more and more sophisticated ways of describing it and predicting it and so on. But we still don't have, from what, what a physicist would say, first principles where you can start everything from scratch and then kind of build up the universe. There are people who are working on such things, but what well, we don't know. So then I now have forgotten what your question was again because they got distracted. I had asked, you know, I had mentioned alchemy and astrology and right. how they've evolved okay. and if magic has evolved. Yes. So and you, you look then at the, uh, the original practices of alchemy and astrology and herbalism, all of them included a component which when they turned into, they evolved from natural magic, which alchemy was, in the chemistry. The part that was left out was the mental side. So – Every one of the medieval ideas that that eventually that became natural magic and turned into modern science all involved the intention and consciousness of the practitioner. All of that got stripped away. So what I'm then saying about the nature of magic is that it essentially is trying to bring back that there is a component. There's an additional component that was left out, which science is pretty good at what it studies. But when challenged with, with consciousness as a factor involved in the nature of reality, science is going to have to expand in order to be able to figure out how to deal with these other elements. The reason why they were left out is because science never knew what to do with consciousness. In fact, up till about 30 to 40 years ago, it wasn't even an, a respectable topic to talk about in the academic world. So we're just at the very beginning stages of academia 
uh, tackling the notion of consciousness. And one of the most interesting trends I see as a result is that as more and more people, especially in the sciences, begin to try to figure out what consciousness is, the more and more popular concepts like uh, panpsychism becomes and idealism. And interestingly, that is exactly what all of the esoteric traditions are about. So th th the reason why real magic I then project as a, a way of looking at the future of science is that this is the leading edge right now of what people are beginning to think of in terms of what consciousness is and what it can do. You know, I was listening to uh, Gordon White talk a while back about panpsychism. I know you know Gordon, but uh, he said that panpsychism doesn't completely solve for consciousness. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't recall if he said it or not, but it, it is a – panpsychism is – kind of a materialistic, it's a neo-materialistic approach. It still says matter is primary, but matter also has bits of awareness in it. So it's, it's a step along the way to idealism. And if you step all the way to idealism, that doesn't work very well either, I think, because you, you can't drop the materialist side. But what I think it does do is, is it gives permission to begin to expand our notions of what we think material is. If material is inherently mental or emerges from the mental world, it's still material, but we can think of it in a new way. Definitely, yeah. You mentioned the uh, the academic interest in magic. You noted some examples in the book of university press publications geared towards the esoteric as well as some peer-reviewed journals covering magic and some other related topics. Were you surprised by this? I was really amazed in in looking at this topic because I originally thought uh, to learn about magic, I'd go into an online bookseller and look up the metaphysical section, which I did. And there you find lots and lots of books about how to grimoires and spell making and blah, blah, blah. You also then find a couple of good books on esoteric history. But then I asked some of my, my buddies in the academic world, uh, if I want to learn about magic from a scholarly perspective, wh where do I go? because they hadn't seen those books. So they started giving me pointers, and I immediately became overwhelmed with hundreds of thousands of books and articles written in scholarly journals about every aspect of the esoteric history or magic that you can imagine, including this journal from the University of Pennsylvania Press, which is specifically on magic and witchcraft. So I had no idea that there was such a thing. Now that I've looked into it more, I realize that almost every country in the world has a, a center or a society for the study of esoteric history and esoteric arts. So it clearly it consumes a large chunk of the academic world, of which I never even thought about before. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know any of that. That is surprising because you would think academia would be more aligned with, with science in that sense, that they would be sort of, you know, a shoe magic. But apparently they're just as open to talking about it as everybody else is. So Well, um, with the proviso. Okay. So the proviso is, and you see this in religious studies departments as well, uh, and, in, and in anthropology and a couple of scholarly disciplines that can that talk about magic, not magic as real. It's magic as beliefs as though those primitive people believed in these things, but not that it is a real thing. There's a very small minority among anthropologists and religious scholars and so on who talk about magic as, yeah, that they, were not, they weren't faking it or deluding themselves. They were talking about something which is quite real. So that's still, even in the academic world, it's okay to talk about beliefs, but it's not okay to talk about it as real. Right, and you actually led into my next question, you know, talking about the anthropologists who were exposed to the magical beliefs of primitive peoples and then the implications of that psi phenomena in the study of magic. And anthropologists even have been split into two camps. You know, some regard magic as a magical religious faith and, and others regard it as a magical scientific practice, which is what you were just talking about. Where's that debate right now as we're speaking? I'd say the majority probably are still going with tradi the traditional approach in anthropology, which is very dead set against the idea of magic as real. Uh, there's a minority that are interested in looking at these phenomena as real. There's also uh, subsets of the anthropology, of the scholarly anthropology associations, which is looking at the anthropology of consciousness. That used to be a separate organization and is now part of the American Anthropological Association. And so they're, they're far more open to the idea of magic as real because they're looking at it from a consciousness perspective. But that's also a minority. So uh, the fact that it exists at all is a new phenomenon. It's relatively new. 
And I think when you look at it then from in parallel with scientists who are beginning to take more seriously ideas like panpsychism, that's the beginning of a trend. And if the trend continues, eventually there'll be more and more people because in the academic world, like every other aspect of what humans do, is we follow the crowd. So we know that magic and religion are, are intimately linked. You wrote that religion is faith-based theory and magic is a testable application of that theory. But that relationship between religion and magic is a bit more complex. You know, and It has to do with the, the split of magic into the two categories, natural and supernatural. How were those two categories defined at first and have those definitions changed at all in recent years? So that historically everything was supernatural magic. It, that it was somehow it was godly because we didn't know anything anything else. Natural magic, you could think of alchemy as a form of natural magic. Uh, it some of it involved the mental aspect of the practitioner, but you no longer needed to imagine that you needed God to intervene in order to turn these substances into bronze, for example, or to make iron. It was a natural process, and it was highly repeatable. So this is where the beginning of science starts, where you see there. Are, irregularities in some things that work regard and you don't need to assume that somebody else is doing anything with it by the same token in astrology astrology and astronomy almost developed in parallel because see while astrology is an interpretation of the regularities seen in the night sky so there it wasn't so much that astronomy came out of astrology it's more like it split in one one sense it the astronomical part of it split and became natural science, which we know today as astronomy. The other side of, of it, which was related to divination, split off and is not considered mainstream now because it, it involved correlations of things that, that in a, a scientific perspective don't seem to make much sense. So for the herbalism, it's much it's very similar then to to alchemy where herbalists initially felt that the practitioner's intention was very important, but then that part got left aside and it turned into pharmaceuticals. So the natural magic part of it is, roughly speaking, from the Middle Ages till now, and then it, it has become what we think of as completely natural without any mag magical quality at all in the modern world, except if you talk to chemists and astronomers and herbalists privately and ask them about their actual experiences – and actually, not even just those disciplines, lots of disciplines, you'll find that scientists oftentimes will talk about weird stuff that happens in the lab. They, they talk about using their intuition to get ideas about what to do next. So the experiential side, the, the, the strange consciousness, maybe magical side of science is still very much there, but scientists learn very quickly. You just don't talk about it, not in public. Yeah. So is intuition then, is that a, would that be a, a staple of magic in action then? Well, in a sense, uh, intuition is knowing without knowing how you know. So there's at least two major categories of intuition. One is forgotten knowledge. So if you're if you spent a lifetime doing something, you gain a certain intuition about things because you you recognize if you're a doctor, for example, and you've been doing diagnoses for 40 years, you can just look at somebody and know what's wrong with them. And it's because you've forgotten the pre previous 40 years of of studying it in depth and seeing certain patterns about how somebody looks or how they behave, and so you just know. And the reason you don't know how you know is because it's so it's so deep in you that you don't have to access that consciously anymore. It's very similar to riding a bicycle. You don't know how you ride a bicycle. You don't have to know anymore because it's been kinesthetically learned. So that's, that suggests that uh, th that form of intuition is, is not as interesting to me because everyone has that. The other kind of intuition is the traditional notion of it, which is, uh, you're getting information and you have no idea where it's coming from because you know you don't know it. You're, you're getting it out of the sky. This is when like entrepreneurs and inventors sometimes talk about getting a download. They, they get information. It turns out it's something real and they make something which is correct. So that's more like clairvoyance. And I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people in Silicon Valley and movie producers and people in lots of different walks of life who have been very successful and most will admit – sometimes in private, sometimes publicly, that they rely very heavily on their intuition to figure out how to do something. So part of that is forgotten knowledge, and part of that is who knows where that comes from. It's divination, essentially. Some will privately admit that they use methods of divination. They'll use a pendul pendulum 
They'll use tarot cards. They'll throw runes. They'll do all kinds of stuff to bootstrap themselves into an answer for something that otherwise they, they don't know how to answer. And to my surprise, initially at least, in talking to various groups in the military, usually the top brass, all of them have no problem with intuition at all. Because oftentimes, especially in a combat situation, you have some information about what's going on, but mostly it's chaos. No, nobody knows what to do. <laughs> yeah. And you're making decisions that are life and death decisions as a commander. And they have to be right. Otherwise, people's lives at their stake, their own life could be at stake. And the ones who tend to be promoted again and again, especially as a result of combat experience, they know very well that they're, they not only had to rely on their intuition, but it had to be correct. And so they would guess repeatedly the right thing to do at the right time. So that they were that those audiences that I've spoken to are much more open to this than I would have expected beforehand. That begs the question then, what do you make of the reality as information theory? Well, it's it's a leading edge in uh, in quantum mechanics theory now and in mathematics and in physics. It is one step in the direction toward a purely symbolic reality or a mathematical reality or one that is based in consciousness. If you think of consciousness as something that that feeds on or or eats or manipulates information in some way, then what the leading edge of science is doing is beginning to go into that domain. That domain for most people is very difficult to think about because it's completely abstract. You know, if you you think of a parallel here between our understanding of physical reality and mathematics. So long time ago, all we had were counting numbers. We're, we're literally meaning one, two, three, four, five. And so we, were, we had 10 typically because there was something you could count. So the notion of zero did not show up for a long time. When zero was invented, there's a whole new kind of, a, of mathematics because now you had the concept of nothing, which we take for granted now, but that was a radical change in mathematics. And then there were fractions, and then there were transcendental numbers, and then complex numbers, and then set theory. And at each stage, you're thinking you're getting more and more abstract in terms of the ability for those numbers to describe anything. And yet, physics has followed. As, as we get better and better ways of, of mathematically describing things in abstract ways, physics has followed. So we wouldn't have quantum mechanics without complex numbers. We wouldn't have quantum field theory without set theory. We wouldn't have string theory without all of the above. And so as mathematics continues to probe into more and more abstract realms, we get more and more abstract ways of describing reality from a physics perspective, which in most cases turns out to be a pretty good description of the way the world works. So that's not going to stop. The, we keep going down further and further and further in terms of our ability to describe, typically in very abstract terms, seems like that's the way that the world actually exists. So I can imagine when you go to the bottom, I mean, it, it, there are turtles all the way down, so you, it'll never stop. But the farther down we can go, if we can keep it intellectually in our head, I think we're going to start bumping up into the eye looking back at us. It's like our consciousness hmm. poking us backwards uh, on this, uh, this yeah. deep dive. Well, that symbolic reality then would, at least I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that would help explain, you know, why sigils do work. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah. like the essence of all magical practices. So you, you make a symbolic representation of the thing that you want. This is for force of will type magic. And in a sense, that, that kind of has to happen because that's the way it's happening all the time anyway. So yeah, that's how a sigil works. Well, you've actually experimented with sigils in a lab setting, right? Not so much as a, a sigil in the form of creating a, an actual symbol for it. This is mostly uh, in, in daily life that I've experimented with sigils. Uh, I put a sigil in the book. It's actually two sigils in the book. One is I a, did see uh, that. I, I was going to ask about those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so one of them is a part of a description of how you would make a, a very simple form of a sigil. The other one is hidden. It's in, I mean, it's in there in plain sight, but you'd have to go looking for it. It's basically a spell put on the book itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's fantastic. Part of the backstory in this book is that it, it's becoming more and more difficult to to get large publishers to publish anything. The, the whole publishing business has gone through a big thrashing over the last couple of years. It's beginning to settle down, fortunately. We at one point it was thought that ebooks would take over the world, and it, it has reached a plateau, and it's no longer taking over the world. So that's good for authors, anyway. So I put a spell on the at the stage of the book when it was just a synopsis. 
And the the spell, it. I mean, I, I'd be very careful about how I talk about this because if you put a spell on a person, that is black magic, and it doesn't matter what the spell is. And so th- this wasn't black magic in the sense that I put a spell on the uh, on the concept that it would be this would be a good thing to do without forcing anybody to actually accept it or not. But it was putting a positive spin on this as being a good idea. And so the, my editor thought that maybe they weren't going to buy it because they were hardly buying any books anymore. But he did. He said, okay, let's go with this book. So that's that's a decision that somebody is making based on, in this case, a, a vice president for acquisitions, I imagine. They are making a, a conscious decision based on lots of information, uh, like budget considerations and that sort of thing, and sales projections and all that. But they have to also come down to their own intuition. How are they going to make this decision? So that's like that's the point where you make a tweak, put a positive tweak on it from a from a spell casting perspective. Maybe that pushed it or not. I mean, maybe it's complete coincidence and it just happened. But uh, that's an instance where I wanted to use the principles of magic on the book itself as a kind of experiment in the in the whole process. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a great idea. But also, writing the book itself is an act of magic, right? Well, it's it's not exactly like word magic because I'm I'm not. I, this is more like an informational thing as opposed to I wish for such and such a thing to happen. Even though I did put a sigil in the book, I think what you may be referring to is one of the experiments we did, which was using a principle from voodoo. So that mm-hmm. that wasn't a, a sigil; it was the use of an effigy. So the, the the backstory here is that we've done lots of experiments over the years to look at the uh, sense of feeling stared at in a formalized way. So unlike the way that Rupert Sheldrake has done it, where you'd have one person sitting with the back to the other, and then one stares at the back of the head of the other person, and the, that person has to say they're being stared at or not. That is a way of doing it. But what I've done is, uh, with with colleagues around the world, we do this experiment where you, you take two people, you isolate one, and you can only look at them through one-way closed-circuit TV, or in the modern world, like a webcam. So they they really don't know. You're not anywhere near them, but sometimes you're looking at them and sometimes you're not. And rather than asking the person being stared at if they think they are, which would require that you consciously get it, we just look at physiological measures. So this is a very, very sensitive way of of seeing whether your body is responding to being stared at or not. So that's been done many times, works pretty well. It's like many of the psi experiments that are done, it's very mental. It's completely mental, actually. That, That typically you're asking somebody to perceive something, they're asking they're to use their intention to do something. Some people can can do that. The reason we tend to use meditators is because they're used to doing mental or mental activity focusing. But a lot of people can't do it. They'll start the experiment and they'll they'll blank out after a minute and they won't do it anymore. Not because they don't want to, but because they, their mind wanders. So we did what you what what is typical in voodoo, where you make an effigy of the distant person. So you no longer have to do this abstract thing where you're looking at them over a video screen. But you have a, a little effigy of them, a little statue. Like so, you make you make a little statue of somebody, and this is the representation of that person. So when you're staring at them, you could hold them, you could touch them, and this is now a symbolic representation of the person that worked really well. That worked so well that we never repeated it because we we did it twice in the lab, and it worked really well in both cases. And it kind of scared us that it worked so well. <laughs> yeah. So, I we, think so this was this was about this was over 20 years ago. And it was my first inkling that maybe there is something in these the magical traditions, the rituals, the methods that are used, which we could bring into the laboratory, which we did, and get much bigger effects than we t- we generally do. Yeah. So I want to transition a bit here. You know, the the one subject that's responsible for me being here right now is hermeticism, and you do mention that in a section in the book that talks about the origins of magic and hermeticism is interesting because it posits a single universal consciousness, you know, with the big C that's split into, as you call them, two complementary aspects, you know, two sides of the same coin. And these two sides are what you call one thing and one mind. I want to define those two concepts, but first, what do you think of hermeticism as a belief system? Well, the, I, I spoke about it in the context of looking, doing a survey of the, the entire esoteric history. You see again and again that the the under the overriding theme that that goes through this entire history is that consciousness is fundamental. That's that's the the one common element among all of them. You find 
whether it's uh, Neoplatonism or Hermeticism or Gnosticism or the Kabbalah, all the way up to today with Rosicrucians and Freemasons, New Thought, Christian Science, Affirmations, all of, the whole thing. It's one one thread, basically, that is all pointing back to this very long historical tradition, but it's shaped by culture, it's shaped by history, it's shaped by language. Hermeticism was one form, possibly traced back into Egypt or ancient Greece, perhaps before that, we don't really know. Uh, similar in some ways to yoga theory, the notion that the you start with a uniform consciousness, which splits in, into two forms. So one, the, the one mind is the aspect of awareness, pure awareness that doesn't have any physical component to it at all. And the other side is the, the one matter, the one thing, which is stuff-like, matter-like. So that suggests a dualistic split, but it's not really. It's it's a it appears to be a dualistic split because it's emerging out of the one out of the one thing under that's both under both of them. So you see the same thing in in the yoga theory called sankhya, where there is the the notion of three things. You have your pure consciousness, which is the substrate of everything, and it splits into the physical world and to the mental world. Because if you have pure dualism, they can't interact. I mean, you can't have two very separate things interact at all, in which case the model doesn't work. You need some commonality that connects them. So the way that I view both Hermeticism and yoga theory and a bunch of other things is, and you see this in the Kabbalah as well, it all devolves down eventually to a single commonality that then emerges into more and more complex forms. So the world, uh, the everyday world that we see is, is a huge number of different types of forms, but Hermeticism or for that matter, Kabbalah or any of the other forms, you, you would imagine that you can then begin to deconstruct it. Actually, very similar to materialism, you do a reductionist procedure, right? Reductive materialism is you reduce down. So the reductive materialism reduces down to matter. Reductive idealism, in a sense, reduces down below that. It just goes down to consciousness, and then it can't be reduced anymore. So... The Corpus Hermeticum, in that translation by Ficino, he was one of the first to suggest that there was one secret truth, one key principle that, that underlies all of reality. Is this really where the idea of a universal consciousness is popularized? That was part of a long tradition as well. You could go back to, uh, in the East, to Zoroaster perhaps, or pre-Pythagoras and in, in the in the kind of the West, the, the Grecian West, or go all the way back to shamanism. You find that the, the it becomes more and more abstract in terms of the assumption of more and more supernatural qualities behind like behind the scenes and what's making everything work. But the notion of a single one underlying principle has been around forever. I think it's like it, it's the it's the commonality that you see besides the notion that consciousness is, is fundamental. You see it even in uh, let's see if this is true or not. It might be true in the Vedas probably is true in the Vedas. So the thing when we think about, you go back far enough in history that the distinction between what we think of as the East and the West begins to break down pretty quick because it is all one melting pot somewhere between India and Greece and China. It all becomes mushed together. This is where I begin to reveal my ignorance because I know that there are scholars who specialize in these very topics and they know in much greater detail than I do about the, the nuances and differences between the, these various traditions. And I decided that I, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life learning the differences. I wanted to spend time learning what the commonalities were because the, the, the point of the book is I needed to have some history there to put this in context. Uh, but if I, I had a limit of about 220 pages and I realized very quickly, I could easily start writing volumes on hermeticism. But that's not my expertise. I wanted to bring it into a different viewpoint, which was basically about science. Yeah. You know, that one thing idea that you mentioned earlier ties in here, too. Some listeners will be familiar with Eliphas Levy's astral light concept. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Franz Mesmer's universal fluid in the book, uh, Wilhelm Reich's orgone energy. This idea of a single underlying truth to reality permeates throughout the history of magic. I mean, I just listed those, th those three examples of three different types of magicians or scientists even that were all describing the same idea or principle, right? Right. So in Hermeticism, the, the one thing has elements of being mind-like, which is interesting. So that may be the connection from a hermetic perspective of how can anything happen. It's because stuff 
has metal qualities to it, and that that's how then you can begin to manipulate it. That is that is not quite. In fact, it's not really dualistic at all. It, it suggests that that you you can take an object, you, you take an object of something, and this has metal qualities in it. So this is a kind of a mental fluid that coalesces into a particular shape. And in, you know, in some respects, yes, it, this started out as somebody's idea of of what this object should look like, and here it is. Well, there are a lot of steps in between, and that's not typically what's thought of in, in magical terms, where you can take a hunk of clay and turn it into a golem, for example, but something like that. So remember that when you, when you start going back more than around three or 400 years, that the, the concepts from alchemy at that point and the concepts in astrology and all the rest, they start to take on aspects of story. It's like a narrative. All of it was narrative back then. Uh, and being pre-scientific, the the language that was used to describe it at the term was very different than what we think of as as the way we would put language now, where we separate things from stories, which we know are complete fantasy, from descriptions of things that we think are true. And arguments could be made that they're not quite as distinct as as these two categories because they overlap, but they're way more distinct than they used to be. That's for sure. So. We need to take the the ancient ideas with a certain grain of salt. That mm-hmm. that is um, actual uh, sodium chloride and not some metaphorical thing. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So we're we got about fifteen minutes left here. I just have a couple more questions for you. You talk about in the book the effects of attention and intention. Both seem to positively influence events, uh, magically speaking. But one of the more highly contested debates revolves around the idea of belief. Do we have any sort of scientific evidence that belief in magic enhances the likelihood of having magical experiences? Yeah, so we did um, – there are many experiments looking at belief and performance and psi tasks. The, the most famous version is called the sheep-goat experiment, where the sheep are the believers and ESP, and the goats are the ones who don't believe in ESP. If you take a classroom like of people, you separate them according to their belief – and they all take exactly the same experiment, you will find that the performance on the ESP task will split according to their belief. So the ones who have positive open belief tend to do better than the ones who don't. So there's roughly 70 years of experiments looking at that idea, and it's extremely clear from the meta-analyses that what I just, just described is we see it again and again. It's, it's a reasonably reliable effect that you can split performance by belief. That, of course, is a, an essence in magic as well. It's one of the factors that makes it work or not. So we decided to do an experiment which looked more closely at this involving the intentional blessing of tea. So with a colleague in Taiwan, th- this colleague is is a member of a Buddhist temple, and they, they've participated in experiments before with us. So this experiment was take a big batch of oolong tea, separate it into two two bins. So one bin is set aside as a control. The other bin is now blessed by the th- three senior monks at this Buddhist temple. Uh, the the big batch of blessed tea is separated into little tiny bottles, and the control is also separated into little tiny bottles. And in a double-blind fashion, they are given out to 200 people at random, which are members of this Buddhist temple. So everybody knows that the name of the game is that some of them are getting blessed tea and some of them are not, but they don't know which is which. They're labeled in a random way. The experiment then is that uh, over the course of one week and the first two days at the end of each day, they fill out a mood questionnaire to so to capture their mood over the course of the day. The three middle days of the week, they drink the tea. The bottle, they get two little bottles of tea, one at 10 a.m. and one at 3 p.m. At the end of the day, they fill out the same mood questionnaire. And then the last two days, they just fill out the mood questionnaire. So we have mood on both sides uh, the beginning of the week, the end of the week, and then this this substance in the middle, which may or may not be blessed. So the blessed tea is blessed with the notion that people who drink it will have elevated mood, will feel um, more vigor, less fatigue, and along those lines. It's all about how mood changes. The experiment is all done in the same week and among the same people in the same environment to get rid of environmental influences and things like news can modulate mood and so on. We also adjusted by... Uh, the degree of neuroticism. This is a personality trait that measures how neurotic you are. And the reason we use that as a covariate is because we know that uh, mood varies more for people who tend to be, have more neurosis. It, it's a strong modulator. For people who are very not, not neurotic, their mood doesn't change very much. So at the end of the experiment, we evaluate this, and it's a double-blind experiment. 
with a control group and a treatment group, and we see a, a significant difference. So that the people getting the, the treated tea, the blessed tea, they had a better mood than the others. But then we'd asked another thing, which is about their belief on what they actually drank. So at the end of the week, did, did you think you were drinking the, the blessed tea or not? And when you split people out by that way, you can now look at the group that said, uh, I got the blessed tea, and I believe that I got the blessed tea, as compared to people who got exactly the same tea. They got the blessed tea, but they didn't believe that they got the, the blessed tea. And then you not only get a, a statistically significant result, but one that's, that's roughly 50 or 100 times more significant. In terms of percentage change, it's like 1,000% better as compared to maybe 20 or 30% better in terms of mood. So this is a way of showing that your belief in terms of what you thought was happening, even though you got exactly the same stuff, was vastly improved for the people who believed, or which you can interpret as they're accepting the possibility that this is actually the blessed tea. And you look on the other side, for people who got the control tea, it didn't matter what they believed. They all got basically no change in their mood. So this this is a way of then showing that the this traditional idea that your belief makes a difference makes a huge difference in this domain. This is one of the reasons, I think, why traditional sorcery is only done under conditions either of complete secrecy, so only complete believers are allowed to even know about the, the practice itself, or it, within psi experiments, we tend to notice that if you have somebody who is present during an experiment who's thinking this is nonsense – Experiment doesn't work as well. So belief is a very a very important modulator. For sure, yeah. And you, you mentioned some similar experience, not necessarily with belief, but you did talk about some blessed chocolate experiments, some blessed water experiments. We don't have to right. talk about those right now, but they're in the book for people who want to, to read more about those. So do we see real sigh in people only with a talent for it? Or is this a feature of the human experience, regardless of how you know mundane or average some of us may seem on the surface? I think any creature that is sentient, not even just human, any, any creature that has some form of, of awareness, uh, which might include rocks, although we have no way of telling if they're sentient or not, so I don't know. I don't know about the split between living and non-living. And it gets very mushy when you get down to viruses. Maybe they're alive, maybe they're not. But at the level of humans, the reason why we're pretty sure that this follows a normal curve in terms of abilities uh, is because basically everything we know about humans in terms of their performance follows that same curve. You will find some people with very strong natural talent, some people who are the equivalent of psi blind. They just don't have it. But the vast majority of people will have some ability, and we know that because lots of the psi experiments have been done with college sophomores who are selected more or less at random or because they want to get extra credit. And, and so we know it's true from that perspective. You just you draw students out of classes and they can show these effects. When you go to the high end, people who are very talented or naturally psychic, you tend to get much better results with a bit of a twist on that and that if you draw somebody who has lots of spontaneous psychic events going on in their life and you bring them into the lab, you're squashing their ability into a form which you want to see under your conditions that is being watched carefully and do it now. And maybe they can't do that. In fact, many can't. So the, one of the reasons why we tend not to work with people who claim strong psychic ability is because they tend to go away disappointed. And we don't want to disappoint people. Is that They don't like us and may say bad things about us. This is not uniformly true. There are lots of people who are talented who come in the lab and they're not really attached. Their identity and ego are not attached to it. They tend to do better, quite a bit better in the lab than people who, are, who, are, who don't claim any ability at all. But it's the ones who, like the profession depends on them being perceived as a psychic. We tend to stay away from people like that. So I have two words here. Choose one of them to describe all the evidence that you've considered on this topic, subtle or conclusive? Depends on the level of talent of the person. For most people, subtle. For some people, uh, conclusive is probably a little bit too strong, but I would say evidential, yes. Okay, last question for you then. Is it better if the true nature of consciousness, is it better if real magic just stays hidden in the shadows away from the mass majority of people. You mentioned uh, you mentioned black magic earlier, and it just 
you know, I, I think if, if you did really reveal this sort of universal truth to a mass population, it might not be good, I guess, just to be very mundane about it. But do you think that it should be kept hidden? Well, of course, the, the paradox of the esoteric and all of the occult literature now is that none of it is hidden. It's all completely available. You can go online and get virtually any book ever written, regardless how secret it w what once was on these traditions. So we're talking here about revealing something to people who at some level already know that it exists. So they, it's, I don't think there's much danger in that. I also have a whole chapter in a book on the implications of real magic and societal potentials and so on. If we figured out magic to the point where we, we had like a scientific handle on it and we knew how to make it a thousand times more powerful than it currently is, we would destroy ourselves immediately. So it, yes, it's, it's, it is a danger in the sense of if everybody was able to make a nuclear bomb in their kitchen, we wouldn't be around for very long because there, not everybody has the same positive intent. But I don't think there's much much danger of that in this case because the, the techniques of magic are everywhere. You, 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 you can't avoid them in the bookstore. Just go to a metaphysical section and you'll get 40 grimoires right overnight. Uh, some people will try to use it. Most people will fail, partially because they don't have the talent or they think that it's something where you get a secret magic thing and you speak it and that's all there is to it. Most of it, to be effective, requires very diligent practice, probably meditation or something like that. It requires both skill through that, lots of practice, and lots of talent. And so just naturally, you're not going to find everybody being an Olympian, and they won't be able to do it. Or they'll do it to such a small degree that it'll happen occasionally spontaneously in their own life, but that's about it. So I don't, I don't think there's really too much danger of it, at least not at this point. If there was a, a breakthrough of some type, a scientific breakthrough perhaps, where we discovered that uh, the right kind of stimulation of the brain or the right kind of nootropic or something like that made these things much better. I asked that question actually when I was doing this research for the, for the U.S. government under, in, a, in a classified environment. What if we made a breakthrough where we could take somebody and turn them into the world's best super psychic and, and just do that? What would happen to that information? And the very fast answer coming back was you will never hear about it again. You'll never be able to talk about it. Because it, is, it becomes way too threatening for the status quo, for reasons that are somewhat obvious. It targets that person. The moment that somebody is known for having that ability, they become a target. They may not live very long. And it's in general, it's just dangerous to, to have that level of power, the power to manipulate. So I think the, the best actual magicians out there, just like the best psychics that I know, they are very quiet about what they do. They realize because it doesn't. It's not difficult to imagine why it would be dangerous, but it is dangerous. It's dangerous for the stability of society, for themselves, for lots of other reasons. So I don't see too much risk for it in the in the short term. Yeah, I do find it to be somewhat odd that a lot of occultists are out there discussing it openly, you know. But I guess eh, if you're just talking to other people who believe in it, what's the harm, right? So yeah, Doctor Raiden. I do appreciate your time. Please do tell people where they can find the book. Well, Real Magic can be found in any bookstore anywhere in the English-speaking world. So far, uh, I don't know if there are any foreign rights that have been sold, but typically that happens after the book comes out. Uh, it'll be in ebook form and every ebook form uh, in paperback and also audiobook. And the person reading the book is the same artist who has read most of the Dan Brown books. So I was very happy to be able to be given four possible voice readers to to do this. And so when I heard his voice, I said, oh, I know that voice. And yeah, he read Angels and Demons and those kinds of books. I said, oh, well, he'd be good for this. So, yeah, so that's the that's the man who read the audiobook version. Awesome, yeah. And those Dan Brown books, man, they uh, they have some low-key magic in them for sure, don't they? Yeah, I mean, he's tapping into this ancient fascination with the notion that the world is more interesting than we generally think about it. And it, yeah, and it's very successful. Definitely, yeah. And where can people find you online? For me, uh, deanraden.org or deanraden.com or the, the same site goes to realmagicbook.com. They all go to the same place. Cool. All right. Well, Dr. Raiden... Good luck with the book. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your research. Really do appreciate it, and I hope to talk to you again sometime soon. It'd be my pleasure. 
And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Dean Radin for choosing to spend some time with us. Real Magic is available most everywhere books are sold, I imagine, including at an independent bookseller near you, which you can find by clicking the link in the show notes. You know, we barely scratched the surface here with Dr. Radin. I would have loved to have had more time with him, but I am extremely grateful to even have the chance to speak with him at all. I mentioned this during the chat, but I first heard Dean's voice over the airwaves in conversation with the late great Art Bell, so you can imagine what a thrill it was for me to share the airwaves with him myself. I know the idea of real magic is nothing new to most of you out there, but it is interesting that we're now taking a, I don't know, materialistic, scientific approach toward the validation of it. You might say we're taking scientism and including psi in it now. And how this narrative unfolds in the mainstream over the next several years will be something to keep uh, a third eye on. And you know, I actually want to talk more about this for just a moment, because I think it's important to question everything. I'm going to do that on Patreon, though, in an extended outro for patrons. So if you want to hear my conspiratorial mind at work, head on over to the Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash oldculture. It's the best way to support the show. And I gotta thank Gabrielle, Mario and Cheyenne for becoming patrons recently, as well as a big thanks to Tess. She also became a patron and an official executive producer of the show. And also thanks to Joe, who upped his pledge recently and also became an executive producer. My thanks to all of you guys for your support. Another good way to support it is to drop the show a five-star review on iTunes. Dollars, downloads, or dropping reviews. It's all helpful, and it's all appreciated. Anyway, I gotta get out of here. Thanks again for being here. Until next time.